I found that suddenly having to manage 17 people <laughs> of varying abilities and of extremely different personalities was, was an immense step change and it was uh, quite a shock and I think that, that that's the one thing that I would say to anyone wanting to step up to being an animation director that is probably the most difficult part of it is managing your team. Um, thank you for joining us for Ruth Ducker Directing Your Animation Career, which is presented by Screen Skills Animation Skills Fund. So right, Ruth, down to your career. This is like, this is your life, Ruth Ducker. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get a red book at the end? <laughs> uh, well, I'll work on it, I'll work on it. Um, so let's start at the very beginning. Um, you, I'm really interested in the fact that you got into animation you were a painter originally, so could you talk a bit about how you went from having a sort of fine art practice into animation, what it was that inspired you and how you made that move between the different fields? Okay, um, yes, my journey wasn't uh, a direct journey to animation, um, but it's, I've discovered actually that it's not that, that unusual. I do know quite a few people who have taken a course via fine art into animation and into filmmaking, <clears throat> so it isn't a million miles away. But initially, um, I, I I wanted to be a painter from quite an early age, probably about 12 or so. And it was my burning ambition to do this. I, I went to college, I went to do an art foundation when I was 18 and then dropped out of college and decided to have a family very young, which <laughs> happens sometimes. So I, I found myself at 22 with two children. And this actually fitted in quite well with painting. I could I could be a stay-at-home mom and still make work. And so I did. And I continued uh, like this for about 10 years. And I actually enjoyed quite a bit of success. I mean, some success, not a massive success. Obviously, I, I wasn't <laughs> making millions, but I was making enough to survive. So that was good. Um, uh, but after 10 years of this, I realised surviving was not quite good enough and I, I wanted to go on holiday that would be nice uh, I think the kids would have wanted to go on holiday I, I, I thought oh, it'd be nice to have a mortgage all those kind of grown-up things that you can't necessarily achieve if you're working as an artist as a painter I mean, some people do and that's amazing but it's that's quite rare so uh, my brother happened to be working in visual effects um, and he pestered me and said look go back to college do a course and move into TV. He suggested I went to do the LAS course at Central St Martins which I believe is still going and, and is now a master's course. At the time it was just a, uh, a postgraduate certificate which meant it was very practical, there weren't, you didn't have to write a dissertation, you just learnt the basic uh, fundamental basics of animation, bouncy ball, run cycles etc. And, and I did that for six months and then uh, started in my animation career so that was how I made the change it, it was it, I hadn't woken up one morning thought I'm going to do this it was being nudged by my brother who was in the industry so that that was the beginning of my journey into animation and was it through him that you were able to find your first role in the industry how did you sort of land that first job once oh, you'd, you'd done the course the coveted first job no <laughs> he'd moved over to the states by the time i finished the course and so i couldn't rely on nepotism unfortunately uh, and i <clears throat> i did i have to admit i was very naive and i did expect to walk out of college and walk straight into a job and that didn't happen so I, I probably spent a couple of my months feeling sorry for myself and um not getting anywhere and i was really lucky actually i had a friend who get who phoned me up and and said oh he'd heard of a runner's job that was going and suggested i phone this company so i phoned them up i went for an interview and i got the job straight away and i would always recommend if you're coming straight out of college or if it's your first job if you can get a role as a runner on any production. I mean, obviously, if you want to go into animation, you'd look for an animation uh, uh, runner's position. If you want to go into film, you'd look for a film's runner position. But uh, just doing that job, you learn so much. You meet everybody and you learn everything that you don't, are not taught at college. You learn 
about how productions are run. You learn about the dynamics within departments. You learn about different departments that you may not be aware of. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that experience was invaluable, really, because if you're not quite sure what you want to do, you could go, oh, I didn't know I could do that, I could do that. But, but also it just, it helps you to appreciate how many different facets they are to filmmaking and to storytelling. And it's, I think that's very helpful if you want to pursue a career, just having respect for everyone that is, that goes, the collaboration, everyone that works on making shows happen. Uh, and being a runner is quite easy. All you have to do is make sure you work hard and you uh, do what you're asked and are friendly. And, and so you know, that, that, was, that was a good job. Very badly paid, but still good job. <laughs> and then from being a runner, um, I know you've done a few different roles from previous layout and then, you know, how did you, how did you sort of move around to the different roles, different productions? Um, <clears throat> so from a runner, uh, you know, as I said, when I, when I came out of college, I had this naive idea that I was going to become an animator. Um, but, but I wasn't driven with one like, pure focus. I didn't want to be an animator at the expense of everything else. I was very interested in other areas. Uh, and, and I think that, that it, had, it, had, it gave me some advantages, but also some disadvantages. So in, early on in my career, it gave me the advantage of being able to pick and choose and, and just go with the flow in terms of jobs. Uh, so I was a runner for a very short amount of time because I was a quite good runner and quite bossy as well and organized. I was quickly promoted to studio manager and then to production manager. So within my first year of work, I'd already had quite a bit of experience of working within production. And, and this after it, it came to a head uh, when I'd been working for about 18 months and I was production managing some idents for Disney Channel. Uh, and, and while that was amazing, you know, I thought, oh, I've reached, I've reached a pinnacle. It was, I realized, very quickly realized that that was not the role for me. It, I found it so exhausting working with scheduling, negotiating with the client, negotiating with the artists, having to manage everything was, was exhausting and frustrating. And it just, it, it was not, it was not an ideal role for me. So it was it very quickly clear that I was not going to pursue production positions. Uh, so I thought that I had to make a choice. And so I plucked up the courage to go and speak to the producer and the head of productions in the company and asked if they'd transfer me to a creative department. They refused. <laughs> so again, plucking up courage, I said that I would leave if, if they didn't do this and give me a creative opportunity. I think that they recognized that I'd been good, I'd worked hard and was a good employee. So therefore they did give me a chance. They gave me a, a month's trial and then I remained in the, that department for coming up to another year. And uh, they moved me into the layout, not animation as well, but, but into layout. But again, even though this choice wasn't my first choice, actually it gave me a, another opportunity to learn a huge amount about productions and learn a huge amount about storytelling and uh, about um, how you make shows on every level because layout is is a it's not only it's creative in terms of your staging shots and your you're working from a storyboard and closely with the director but it also <clears throat> is quite technical so you're having to resolve issues of how to how to keep the story moving through time so again that was that was a great experience and a great job um, again at this stage in my career it was because I had that early start and I was lucky to have been in a company that I stayed in and progressed within uh, I, I found that I worked on the first show I worked on was a film called Free Jimmy, which is a Norwegian cult classic. If you haven't seen it, it you should. It's completely insane. Um, and then when that came to an end, we all, the whole team moved on to Tractor Tom, which is a preschool uh, episodic show. And again, it was very different in terms of the content, but it, the approach was great. And again, working with another great director and learning a huge amount about that director's method and 
at, at what they wanted to see. So those, those roles were quite easy. And that first stage of my career, I say easy, that first stage of my career after having got into a position was easy to maintain. And I think that oftentimes, once you get an opportunity, you'll find the first couple of years are, uh, can be quite rewarding because you're cheap and you're working hard and you're enthusiastic so, so you're always you're highly employable it, it was after that stage that things started to get a bit difficult and so how did you once you'd kind of got your foot in the door and you'd done track to tom how how did you find other work um because you mentioned like you moved as a team did you find that that having those team relationships was useful for future roles and yes absolutely yeah. crucial and and i'm still actually friends with a lot of the people that i met at that point uh, we're still quite close and we till, still tell each other about work obviously we've all gone we split up and gone in quite different directions over the last 20 years but it's it's still we've been very supportive so if you are entering a career the people that you meet and the people that you're with are so important and it's really important to to foster these relationships and uh, and maintain them because they will be the people that you grow with and that start to find work and that start to recommend you uh, especially if you get on with people um, but also you can learn so much from from the people that you're surrounded by they can fill in gaps in your knowledge and you can help fill in gaps in their knowledge but I think also on top of that you have it's not just the work it's also your the things that you're interested in so the things that you're interested in the outside world which enrich your your voice and and help to you to give something to the role so you might talk about films you might talk about stories you like you might talk about something else entirely <laughs> but it's it's really those relationships are really important and really key to helping keep your feet on the ground helping keep you say when you're going say but also just helping you move through your career and what what would you be your tips for freelancers you know people that are looking to get into freelance and how you kind of I mean, other than the networking how you kind of maintain a career over time how you keep yes. moving from production to production yes so freelancing honestly to begin with i hated it and i really wanted to to secure that coveted full-time job obviously the first so the first four years of my career, I was, I managed to have uh, PAYE jobs, which was amazing. But as soon as I was forced uh, into freelance, it, it suddenly became this big, terrifying thing. You've not only have you got to do all your own admin <coughs> and pay for work and accounts, you have to also do the job search. And, and sometimes you might have a job that only lasts a couple of weeks. So you're, you're constantly in this process of looking for work working and um, doing all the other bits that go with being freelance and, and so <clears throat> i i was a very reluctant freelancer but i suppose i'm used to it now and it is something you do get used to and, and you have to be self-disciplined so you have to communicate you have to like like you said i mentioned before uh just talking to people and networking is really important so you know what's going on in the world and spending time chatting to people and, and just being interested in what they're doing uh, is is important um, because also you just hear about work that way uh, looking on the internet is very important because a lot of big companies post work and just pestering people and that again is a difficult thing because you'll you'll have many many rejections and actually i was just recalling with a friend earlier on in the week uh, how once i sent out something like a hundred showreels and i didn't get a single reply <laughs> those things can be quite demoralizing you could just think everyone hates me i'm never gonna make it but you just have to persevere and and not take it personally so if you're freelancing just keep on trying keep on pushing and if you get knocked back stand up again it's not personal if someone rejects you it's just his life another thing also with the freelancing i think to keep in mind is being versatile so while everyone wants to do the big blockbuster film or the cool game everyone wants to work on those high profile jobs you can't always get that and 
being prepared to do things that are maybe slightly less romantic and uh, just pay the bills again that is is something that I found helped me stay employed for some people they don't have to do that for some people they they uh, are in the right place at the right time and they have the right skills and they go from from strength to strength uh, but that isn't the only way there are other ways and and so it's it's not a right way or a wrong way it's just if you can do many different things do be prepared to be versatile because it it will keep you fed can we just talk about preschool content because you've worked in quite a lot of different series over the time over the time from tractor tom onwards um was this intentional or did you find that once you kind of did one preschool series it was a sort of natural flow to move into others oh, yes was this your dreams desire to be a preschool <laughs> specialist no no it wasn't it wasn't i hate to have to say that it wasn't i should say oh i love it it's great it's my bread and butter uh, no as you said I, I having done tractor tom having that on my showreel i then actually went on to work on captain scarlet and hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and uh, peter and the wolf and and so these are they're not preschool shows they they're adult content but uh, it, when I was freelancing, when the sort of regular work dried up and when I was no longer a junior, when I was mid-level and so therefore it, hoping for, for mid-level jobs and hoping for a little, uh, to earn a little bit more, uh, I found that I, all the jobs that I was approached to take part in were preschool because I had preschool on my showreel and they seemed to be easier to get in into I think that again the the more prestigious roles are everyone wants them and so only the really really exceptionally brilliant or or people who are just again right place and right time or have the the right stuff on their showreel will will get those roles and I, I found that I was offered preschool and so I took preschool and yes so i hate to have said it wasn't a a specific choice however there in the uk especially not not only but it it is quite um a buoyant industry within the uk preschool animation a lot of preschool content is animated so therefore there is more work in that respect um it tends to be quite uh balanced in terms of gender and i think that's partly because it's not very well paid and women tend to be more prepared to take lower paid jobs than than men for an equal level but also another thing that's interesting is that quite often preschool they have within the production and within the team have a lot of people with families so therefore the working conditions are favorable you'll do a 95 you won't do a 16 hour day uh, generally speaking at uh, the normal level so again it's it's a much more uh, friendly working environment in that respect um so no i didn't choose it it's great to see the variety of things you've worked on there yes yeah so that that was because i was prepared to do anything basically for money <laughs> so it's like <laughs> a job came along will you do this yes i'll do that so uh, and it's it's funny when you look at it and you think yes it is very diverse but at the time it just seemed to make sense so i was i was offered a layout job and i did layout and I, I was offered a pre job and so i went i did pre and and again a, the connection with friends this was very important at this stage so most of these jobs here were because either one of my team members was was working within the production already or they heard about it and we all applied at the same time and we said we'd work together so they hired us as a team and that was so all of those jobs there were a consequence of of having friends that helped each other out early on um, and also as a consequence of being prepared to try something new and being uh, happy to to take a job that was perhaps considered slightly lesser than the coveted animators job or and so that that's while you know at the time it didn't seem that romantic actually looking back on it I learned a huge amount and and I think it's been really helpful in my career later on 
I mean, you say the coveted animator role, you got the coveted animator role eventually. <laughs> eventually, <laughs> yes. It was eventually. I mean, it did take me, uh, I, I think actually the break was, was Peter and the Wolf, funnily enough. It's such an amazing film and it was uh, such a privilege to work on it. Um, and it was very badly paid again. We were paid, we were working in London doing the previs on it. We made the whole film in CG first. And, uh, but be, before it was animated out in Poland, but being able it's to stop work, motion, isn't it? It's stop motion, yes. yes. And being able to work with Susie Templeton, Templeton, the director, was amazing. Working so closely with a brilliantly talented individual, she, and, and seeing how she put the shots together, seeing her thought process, and and how she unfolded the story and told it. So that that was a great experience. Uh, and and then it, it went on to win the Academy Awards. So suddenly I have worked on a show that's that has an oscar and that helps that really helps <laughs> so again it's it's the odd jobs that you take and at the time i turned down a much better paid job to do this because i like the idea of it rather than just going for the money so sometimes those you might get those opportunities where you think do you take the piece that is creative or do you take the piece that is well paid and in this instance it, it i think that i made the right choice and so from, from that experience, you, do you moved on to being an animator from doing the previous oh, on yes. Peter and the Wolf? So on, from this experience, I, I then got my first, or I had the confidence maybe, to get my first animation job. Uh, and again, this was having a phone call or a text message from a friend saying, this company's looking for work, uh, apply, quickly phone them up and apply for this job. They, they need an animator. And I'd never actually worked as an animator, animator on a proper production. I'd only done layout and previs and lighting and rendering. And so it, again, it was, it was kind of like <laughs> scary, but I thought I'd go for it. The, the company and this the company still do this. Actually, the company was offering a week's trial where you learned the software they were using specifically. Uh, you spent four days learning the software and then a day showing what you'd learned. Uh, and making like run cycles, walk cycles, and a little featurette or some, some work to show that you could uh, perform to show acting. And there, I was one of five other animators and I was really, I very quickly realized I was not the best technical animator in the, in the lineup. And, uh, and I thought, oh, well, I, I thought I wasn't gonna get the job. So I enjoyed myself. I learned the software, which was great. Um, to do for free obviously uh, and then at the end I just did made a silly little uh, short film uh, using the characters that we could that uh, were part of the show and, and because my animating wasn't very good I thought I, I have to disguise this so I, I made a cut I made cut scenes and and I put together this little story that ended up with one of the characters heads exploding and I thought that that by by making people laugh and and having a, a sequence rather than one shot, it would disguise my my weaker animation. Anyway, I was both surprised to find that I got the job, which was was really, which was great. But it was also I kind of felt embarrassed because I thought, oh no, I'm not the best animator, and they've chosen me. <laughs> I've hoodwinked them. But it was again a valuable lesson in learning that to be resourceful and, and learning to to recognize your weaknesses and, and maybe play to them or, or find ways of, of getting around them. So that was my first animation job. It, it was on the secret show. It was, it was brilliant. I worked with some such talented animators and I would say that was when I learned to animate, working on that. Before that and at college, my animation was, I, I hadn't spent enough time doing it to really have uh, achieved any level of animation but it was on the secret show that I did learn animating uh, and, and it was most enjoyable. And so from from there you worked at Spider Eye in Cornwall didn't you on was it Jungle Junction you worked yes. on as an animator yes. and then you were able to step up to animation director from that, yes. that position how did yes. you make that transition because that's quite a that's, that's quite a different <laughs> Different role. <laughs> it's, well, it is quite a different role, but it is also in direct line. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it is a step, a big step, but it's not a, a very diverse step. Um, by the time I worked on Jungle Junction, 
I had worked on several other after the, uh, after the secret show. I've worked on several other shows. I'd worked in back doing background art for a TV show. I'd also worked on an, uh, a couple of other long form animation shows, preschool shows. So I did have quite a bit of experience in in animating by the time I came to work on Jungle Junction on series one. And again, it was great fun, worked on the first series, but I, I had been doing it long enough to realize that I was, as I said, I was not the best animator. I was never going to work for Pixar. I was, I was always going to be in this loop of being okay, but not brilliant. And my performance, I can, I'm good at performance, but I'm not very good at the technical technicalities of animation. So, I, and I'm good technically, and I'm good at finding creative solutions as well. And, and so I realized that I needed to play to these strengths. I needed to not focus too much on just animation because it wasn't my strength. Um, so it came to the end of the first series and I thought, okay, one of those moments where I have to take courage or I'm going to be just vanishing down the plug hole. So I approached the producer and asked her if they did a second series, if she would take me on as animation director. And to sweeten the deal, I said that I would set up a, an animation library, which meant that there was greater consistency across all the shots and all the animators of character and of, of style. Uh, and, and also it would be that the animators wouldn't have to waste time doing standard animation. They could focus on the more complex scenes. So it would mean that you could produce higher footage and also uh, better work across the board as a standard. Uh, she, she, I think was quite surprised when I asked her, but nine months later I had the job. So that was great. It was a, a great moment for taking courage and just saying, yeah, I want this and, and standing up and, and making your own change and, and also owning the things, recognizing your strengths and recognizing your weaknesses and, and pushing your strengths. Do you think that coming to her with a, with a, with a proposal of how you could sort of improve the system was a sweetener do you think that really helped seal the deal or do you think you would have got it anyway um i think that sealed the deal i think it did did help i think that any producer wants to know that you can have a, a higher standard of consistent work any producer wants to know that you're going to be able to produce more work in in a short amount of time so i think that maybe my experience of having worked in production very briefly way back in the day had had helped that helped me understand that this is something that producers are focused on and if you can give them that carrot then they're going to go yeah 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 i don't want to don't care what else you do as long as you do that um so i think it did help for sure and how did you find managing a team of animators in that position and what sort of advice would you give to people who want to be animators and how you work with an animation director. Okay, so if you want to be an animator and that's what you love, go for it and pursue it. If you want, if you're, if you want to be an animation director, you don't actually have to be the best animator. You just need to understand animation and you need to understand character and you need to understand th storytelling. So, so what, they're not uh, mutually exclusive. You, it, the, you can be, you can be both or you can be one or you can be the other. Uh, it's, I think animation direction is different in that the one thing that you need to have that you don't have to have as an animator is people skills. And that is probably something that is, is the most difficult part of stepping up. I think I found that suddenly having to manage 17 people <laughs> of varying abilities and of extremely different personalities was was an immense step change and it was uh, quite a shock and i think that that that's the one thing that i would say to anyone wanting to step up to being an animation director that is probably the most difficult part of it is managing your team you have to you have to be able to support and encourage the people who are struggling or or who have fragile egos you have to keep under control the ones who have massive egos. Uh, you have to resolve conflict. You have to be able to push people to achieve what they're capable of achieving within usually not enough time. Uh, and you also have to please the directors. You have to make sure that, that you're satisfying their requirements for the show and also make sure that you're on time, you're pleasing the production. So again, it, it was a big step change going from 
animator to animation director. And, and, and that's what I would say to anyone, if you do want to do it, great, go for it. But it's, it's not just a bigger and better animation job. It's a whole different thing. And do you think then that being an animation director set you up well for being a series director? Um, I would say yes. I would say the step the, to series directing was, was not as big. Uh, so I'd been, I was animation director on Jungle Junction. I then went on to be animation director on a show called Bodge for CBBS, And, and then when that finished, uh, my producer there advised me to apply for another animation director role on a show called Flugels. Uh, so I applied for this and uh, they didn't offer me the animation director role. They offered me the series director role, which was quite surprising. I was like, oh my goodness. And so I was quite terrified thinking, oh no, it's another big step. But actually, when I arrived and started to do the job, it was very similar than to the animation director role. I just had less responsibility for the animation team specifically, but I had a similar sort of responsibility for everybody. So the same method really applied to everybody. You have you I had to know what people remember people's names which was difficult that was really difficult step one <laughs> yes yeah, step one although I, I found that if I just made up names for them it was okay as long as I was consistent with my made-up names or just call them all Bob but so uh, but knowing about people so talking to people again this applies to animation director but talking to people about themselves and what their motivations are and, and what their fears are and what their hopes are. That was, that was very important part of it because you begin to understand why people, you understand how to get people to work to the best of their abilities. You also understand why people are not, when they're not working to the best of their abilities. Uh, uh, because, and again, this, this applies to life, I imagine. And, and, you go into work and someone's a bit mean to you. You just think, "Why are you being mean to me?" But you just think maybe some they've got some shit going on in their life, and and it's nothing to do with you. So again, those lessons of of nurturing the team and supporting the team were quite uh, were were there from animation direction. So it was quite an easy step to take into being a series director. The the bigger there was a bigger change in terms of story, being in charge of story much more, which was great. I'd only ever read scripts, I hadn't really been able to interact with them that much. And at, at this point I was able to interact, but again, having worked on 104 episodes of preschool shows, I, I'd read a lot of scripts. So I knew, uh, I felt comfortable interacting with scripts. Uh, and then on Flugels, we also had, there were live action with CG characters, with animated characters. So live action, I'd never done any live action before. And that was a, a new experience, but again, as with animation it is just storytelling the the difference is with animation you have absolute control and with live action you quite often have no control uh, uh, being able to appreciate that is it's nice to be able to do both actually um, yeah someone's asked in the um, chat just for you to clarify what the difference is between an animation director and a director so can you just outline that for people watching okay so to clarify that, it depends on the production you're working on, because in some, in some productions you will be called an animation director if you are a director and the show is animation. In other companies you will be called an animation director if you're just in charge of the team of animators and you're just directing performance. So another role, another title for animation director is performance director. Uh, in, in yet another, environment and animation director you might be um directing the story team and the animation team so so it it does vary it's a bit like episodic director uh, and director the the name the title is is quite broad and can cover a number of different things it really does depend on the specifics of the, the role that you're you're working under thank you and then as your role as a director, what, when you're working with a team, so you're obviously working, as you sort of said, across, so you're looking at pre-production with the story team and you're looking with the animators and then you're involved in post as well. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you're looking for or how you sort of manage those people in the different departments? Um, uh, okay, this is a difficult question. I, I would say that the thing 
that the thing that is most important is to understand that animation and filmmaking is collaborative. Uh, every single person within the team has a part to play and every single person is important in their contribution. And, and so therefore it, you need to value each person. I, I would always approach it on an individual basis. So I just try and, and treat people individually and, and, and you know, every day I would go and talk to people, find out about them and just, yes, treat them like individuals, but also then encourage them to be part of the team as well, reminding everybody that, that we're in it together, but we are still individuals. Uh, I, I'd also try and organize team social events, which again are, are quite important as part of team building. So it mustn't all be work. It's, it's good to have play. I have to admit though, I did notice a difference between animation director with the anim being the animation director, because I wasn't the top of the pile. I was able to uh, uh, devolve responsibility a little bit and I could go out and socialize much more with my team. When I became series director, I did have to keep a slight distance because if I was going to be the, the authority and, <laughs> and having to crack the whip and having to actually discipline people in terms of this work is not good enough, I need to do you, you to do it again. I had to maintain some kind of distance. So, so actually I did with being a series director, it is a slightly more distant role in terms of that. You're not gonna be buddies with everybody. You have to be able to maintain an authority because ultimately you're responsible for what, for the final thing. And so therefore you need to be able to, to know when to be assertive and know when to be soft and gentle and nurturing. Is that the question? I can't remember what the question was. Again. No, that's 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 a perfect answer. Thank you. And I know you came at this career from <laughs> from being advised by a relative, uh, and yeah. here you are today as a successful series director. Um, but how? What would you advice would you give to a new entrant today? You know, someone who's just coming into the industry who wants to one day direct series like like you. What What do you think that you would say to people now? They would need to do to what able to, to, do. to get there what you need to do well directing is a very individual thing and it it's so you'll hear one director saying oh you've got to do this and another director saying oh you've got to do that and and it's something that you have to discover yourself you have to discover your own voice you have to discover the things that that interest you and the things that motivate you and things that that you want to say but that is part of it and i would say constantly look at other people's work uh, and copy it's not bad copy copy what you like take what you like and and build on it so that's one thing is, is learn your voice and that's that's separate you don't have to do that when you're working in the industry you can just do that reading books watching films uh, whatever all of those things being taking part going to courses and taking part in in collaborative projects so to learn your voice learn learn what you want to say Another thing I would say, again, there is no singular route. You'll have people who come straight out of college, they've made a handful of short films, they continue to make short films, and then they, they, they find the opportunities that keep them directing. Again, that's another way. I, I would say that my, my journey was slightly more zigzag, and it was, it was probably because I had not considered directing as my end game early on. It was something that I discovered. It was actually something that, that was suggested to me rather than uh, me going, ah, oh, that is what I want to be. And, and I feel slightly guilty in that respect because I think there's so many people who want to be a director and they're really driven to do that and then they don't realise that opportunity. But I think maybe other people saw the capability in me more than I saw it in myself. And my journey was, was discovering that through going through so many different roles and different paths thinking well I can do this I enjoy this but it's not the thing and and just keeping on moving and then finally when I did get my when I did my first directing job it was like oh wow this is what I've been waiting for all my life oh something I can actually do <laughs> okay so again what I say to people if you're just coming out of college and it's what you want to do you go for it don't lose sight of what you want to do but but don't be put off if it's not a straight line so if 
you can have something in the back of your mind and still pursue it and experience many other things as well. And it's, it's none the less than if you do take a straight path. So just go for it. Do you find from the position you're in now um, as a director and do you, do you, are you encouraging people? Are you sort of taking people with you to different series? Um, yes, generally speaking, I will, you'll get favorites and you'll get people who you think I can work with you. We get on well, we have the same sensibilities. I'll take you along with me. This happens. This tends to be editors and story artists that you'll find and writers. Um, it, so you will take people with you, but there currently actually there's a lot of work in animation in the UK. So it's sometimes difficult to get the people that you want. Um, but in, t in terms of encouraging people, I also like to encourage new people coming into the industry. And I, I'm especially, you know, I noticed a few women there. I'm especially interested in encouraging more women to, to come in and step up into, uh, into higher creatives, more senior creative roles, because there are just are not enough. And it's, it's not that, uh, and I think that it's to do with the story. So to have diversity of stories, we need to have a diversity of storytellers and, and that just is not quite balanced yet so we need more uh, yeah just more different voices and and that is something that i look to so wherever possible i will hire someone from a, a minority group obviously my primary focus is to get the best person for the job but within that if it's a choice between two and, and one's from a, a minority i will choose a minority because i think i, I want to give you the opportunity and um, and what's actually an interesting point on this is the last time I was looking for an assistant director, I, I advertised for assistant director it was for a kids show, for a long form kids show. And uh, I got hundreds and hundreds of applications from boys and one from a girl. Of all the, the boys that applied or the men that applied, probably about 80% of them did not have the required qualifications, but they still required they still applied for the role and uh, of the one girl who the one woman who applied she was vastly overqualified so of course hired her <laughs> because she was the most qualified but but i was wondering i was thinking why don't i have more when and not more women applying why is it why do they not have confidence the com the same confidence that the men have and so i would say it's to the women here Yes, if you don't have any of the, the requirements that's post, that are part of a post for a job, don't apply. But if you have some of them or half of them or just over half of them do apply because you can guarantee that there will be other people applying with, with the same level of experience. And, and while you might not get the job, it's still good practice and it's good practice being rejected as well because again, it, it becomes easier to accept a rejection the more you have. Questions that are coming in, there are quite a few questions about um, courses for beginners. So a lot of people who are very experienced in animation, who are interested in where they could look to find out more information. Do you have any sort of tips about where people can find resources so, about animation? Well, I would say yourselves, Green Skills, actually, you, you have a lot of advice on, on that, on courses, uh, but also uh, even just on YouTube, you can look, watch uh, people uh, explaining about their process and going through how they animate on YouTube and maybe that's a good way to start before you look into courses that there, there are um, was it animation mentor I think is mm -hmm. is the yeah. big one is the popular one but that's quite pricey so I would suggest that you have a play around first and have a look on uh, uh, YouTube courses yeah first, um, there's Blender, that. Yeah, Blender, there's Blender. Free, yeah open source yeah, software course. and yeah there'll be some online training I know there's something called Anim Dojo, which Blues are involved in. Yes. For people who are interested, that, they do yeah. quite a lot of masterclasses. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, I think that um, Toon Boom they do classes as well. So there are lots of opportunities, and it's just a matter of trawling the internet and finding them. Uh, Escape Studios they do courses, short courses as well. Um, so uh, then there, there are different levels of courses, and I would say if you can find a taster course or something that's free and uh, maybe sign up there, there's another one i can't remember what it's called um if i if i remember i'll let you know to pass on to people um but if 
I would suggest before investing in the expensive courses, because some of them can cost you up to £10,000, which is a lot of money, uh, I would look into free things first or cheaper things first, uh, for sure. Or even if you can go and get uh, like a, a runner's job on an an, in an animation company, that is a way, again, to, to have access to people who will share their knowledge with you. And that's another way of doing it. Yeah, Especially if you're true. not absolutely certain if you want to be a runner, but you're you're Ill interested in in TV and film and storytelling, then and doing something like being a runner again will give you, like I said uh, at the beginning of the talk, it will give you an, a broad understanding and access to all the different areas, and and you might find something that you prefer to and that that is that you suddenly think, oh, I, I would rather do this in animating. So again, don't don't rule that out. Okay, and one final big question for you. <laughs> uh, do you think that gender balance in directing has improved over time and are people starting to take the issue more seriously? <laughs> How candid can I be? Um, no, uh, yes and no. Um, I think there are, is a lot of talk about it and there are very small inroads, but I think there is a massive way to go. And, and while, and when we talk about imbalance, it's not just gender, it's also sexuality, it's also mental health, it's also uh, age. There, there is so much inequality that it's very difficult to address it all in, in one big step. And it is a very slow process. Uh, things are changing, but it, with, we are so entrenched in a way of thinking that it is difficult and, and unconscious bias is a, a massive thing. Uh, companies, I think, are recognising this and beginning to change. And interestingly, what, what's a curious side effect of this, the coronavirus pandemic, is that actually it may begin to change the way that people work and make opportunities for more diverse stories. And, and that is, is something positive. And uh, it might accelerate the change, but but at the moment there is still a long way to go in that respect. What do you think? Okay, very maybe <laughs> this is again too big a question. But what would you like to see uh, studios doing to address this, other than hiring more women directors? That seems quite an obvious one. <laughs> yes, hiring women, more women directors. <laughs> I I would like to see them taking greater risks on on diverse groups are not just choosing the same people that they've chosen before, not just saying, well, I'm comfortable with you, white bloke, middle-aged white bloke, so I'm going to hire you. Uh, and sorry, sorry if there are any middle-aged white blokes in this, it's not personal, <laughs> but it's, it's, I think that we, we all want to see different stories. We will want to experience other people, have, see into other people's lives and what, how they view the world. And in order to do this, we have to have more people telling those stories. So it is really, it, we are all enriched by that. Yeah, and I know um, BIFA does unconscious bias training, um, mm, yes, which BIFA members and BAFTA members have to do. And we have it, I think there's courses running on our website at the moment. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, probably people on this call don't need that enlightenment, but it's certainly, I've, I've done it with people who at the end of it were like, wow, I never thought of these things. Yeah. And they're sort of sitting there going, well, I think, I think most yeah. of us who are, you know, from, uh, yeah, women can yes. kind of recognise these kind of unconscious biases. So I think it's quite an interesting one if you can do the bit for unconscious bias training. It's yeah, no, definitely. And I think that the, the younger generation are, are less entrenched in that way of thinking than the older generation. So there is, uh, that, that is positive and that is a good thing. And I think that things will, as that the younger ones come up, then things will change more rapidly. And I, I think that part of the problem, it's not just men discriminating against women, it is women discriminating against women as well. So it's, it's not a simple thing and it's not a simple solution. And the thing that I would say in that respect is if you're working in an environment and you feel as if a woman is actually giving you an unreasonably hard time more than the other, your colleagues, I would say that don't be hostile, try, try and, like impress upon her that you're not a threat. Oftentimes they're, they're senior women who have had to work really hard and, and fight prejudice themselves in order to achieve a senior role. And they're, they're holding on to that for dear life. And, and that is, you need to recognize that and, 
and show that you're collaborative and not hostile towards it. So I think that it's our responsibility to to each other as women to, to say, you know, we're in this together. Let's not fight amongst ourselves as well so on that side. Great stuff. And then just finally to ask you, Bruce, uh, what are you working on? What can we see that you've been working on recently? Where can we find you on the internet? I'm all over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly inappropriately so. I have to have a disclaimer on my Twitter because I do say things that it probably is one o'clock in the morning when I shouldn't be tweeting after a couple of ciders. Um, so I, you can Google me and I do come up on the first page a couple of times. So yeah, do follow me, find me. Um, so and what I'm working on at the moment, I'm currently just about to start on a, another preschool show. Uh, this time as supervising director, which is very nice because it's it's more hands off. So I'm much more nurturing. I'm nurturing their, their up and coming director, who's a woman, and this is her stepping up from animation director. So again, it's it's good to be to have that responsibility to help her find her steps, her first steps into full directing. Um, that starts at the end of May. Um, and then I'm, I'm doing all my other, my own stuff. I just doodle, I just doodly, doodly animate stuff the whole time. Uh, I'm also developing a, a show with a young writer and just trying to fill out the BFI funding form, which is a nightmare. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm just busy. I keep busy the whole time. I don't do relaxed very well. And that might be another advisory for being a director. I think you have to be hyperactive that it helps because it's it's a constant movement and, and if you sit back and relax and put your feet up then someone else will probably pass you. You could also take time to look after yourself <laughs> and your mental well-being. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> oh that old nutshell, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much Ruth, that was brilliant. Thanks for sharing your journey with us. Thank you everyone for coming along and again thank you Ruth that was brilliant. That's okay thank you everyone